Okay, everybody, uh, hope you enjoyed the, uh, the little break. Um, the way we're going to do this now is that just hand in the air question. Um, I'll roll with the mic, and then each of the directors along here uh, and the manager will be happy to answer the questions. Just taking the point that Malcolm said earlier on, let's just make sure that we do this in a respectful way. Um, and the other thing to point out as well is the fact that we did hand out a load of frequently asked questions. So please have a look at that first off to make sure that we haven't answered it on there. But I'll kick that off now. So hand up for the Obviously, first question. Uh, God willing, we'll still be in the league, uh, league two next season. Um, if by chance we weren't, what is the prospects of where we might be playing next season? I know it's a it's a loaded question, but uh, I'm involved in Spitty Park in, in that talk as well. So I'm sure everybody's interested to know what might happen. Um, well, first of all, we need to realise, and I'm sure the board has looked at this quite carefully, the impact of relegation is significant in financial terms. Uh, what, what happens is, whilst we retain the uh, EFL allocation money, we use the money from the Premiership, so there's a loss there of something like £450. We don't know what that the case, but the difficulty is that the the main cost of our operation, that is administration, Rodney Parade pitch wise and Rodney Parade <coughs> in each day staging, staging will say, stay the same. So there's some difficult factors there to all balance. But the fact is, we have an agreement with Rodney Parade for 2023, and I have to tell you, that does not have a termination clause on either side. So the answer is, I think, that we will probably have to talk sensibly about look at the staging costs of that and see if they can be reduced. That might be closing part of the ground, for example, during certain games. But we'll have to adopt a financial profile that reflects our new situation. And the main hit layer area could be the playing budget, which we need to really reduce. They are lower on average in the and I'm bound to say the academy could well be at risk. The grant continues on the EFL. We pick up a substantial deficit from that, and we'd have to look at that. Um, I find it horrific to even think about it. And uh, that's why this man is here. Would, would the rent reduce if we were relegated to the conference, or would we still be paying the same price? The same price. I'm sure I read somewhere, I don't think I'm that senile, that somebody did say there were great clauses in that 10 year piece. No, uh, I can show you our, our legal guy said there are no break clauses. Oh, you mentioned the academy. Is there a sort of a quick overview you can give us of the academy? Yeah, we can. Byron's at the back of the room, so we can do it. <laughs> Here we go, man. Okay, so first of all, where we're at at the minute, um, we're competing very well as, as a Category 4 academy. Um, I presented to the board about Category 3 and, and moving forward. Obviously, that has to be looked at considering uh, where we're at at the minute as a football club. Um, very much on the front foot with that, so we're speaking closely with the Football League, Bob Bloomer, our regional representative of, of, of moving forward. Um, we're in a good place for that. Uh, it's kind of just working out the little bits in regards to financial uh, requirements to, to see where we're, we're at in regards to, to moving forward. But in regards to on the field, we're competing with the, the likes of Bristol Rovers, a very good Cat 3 Academy, uh, Premier League, Bournemouth, Exeter City, who've turned out multi-million pound players over the past five, six years. So on the field, we're competing very, very well. Um, and it's, it's the right time to move in the direction of Category 3 and protect their assets from 7s to 16s, because at the minute they're not protected, and, and move this academy forward. Obviously the football club's the, the main priority, and then staying in the football league is, I'm sure you all agree. Thanks very much for that, Byron. Right, Jennifer? Uh, evening. Um, sorry, this is a question for Graham. I should have, um, should have asked it earlier, really. Um, but what I can't understand, Graham, and I wondered if you could give your view on it, is that with our recent poor form, I can't quite understand
understand how it wasn't so long ago that we went eight or so games unbeaten. Uh, we had some great results, you know, wins at Accrington and Notts County and beating Carlisle, who know, were previously unbeaten uh, until that time. And then all of a sudden, we can go eight games and pretty much the same group of players um, and not secure a point. I just wondered, you know, what, what your view is on that? Yeah, um, I think when when you walk in the door at a football club, there's, uh, there's always a bounce factor, as in you can produce the very, very best from people um, for a short period of time. And um, I think that for a short period of time, we had probably the best players, Labadee accepted, available. Um, we didn't have suspensions to people like Rig. We didn't have injuries to people like Rig. We didn't have suspensions to people like Bennett. Um, we had the best players available for a short period of time. And I think we had a little bit of a bounce, but anyone who was close to me would know that sitting in my office, I was talking to the likes of Dino and Vinny and saying, we've got some major problems here. Um, I wasn't breeding negativity, but I knew I was watching. And we were getting results, yeah, and we wanted to create some momentum around it. Of course, I'd be foolish to say we're getting results, you know, let's all get negative and down about it. But we were, we were drawing over 180 minutes with Alfreton from the National North. I mean, that's, in that seven unbeaten, two of, the, two of the results we got were against Alfreton from National North. And with all due respect to them, um, a football league club getting 180 minutes against Alfreton from National North should be spanking them. Um, and we were 2-2 we were two, two and could easily have gone out. So, and I don't think we got a lot wrong. I don't think we played the game in the wrong way, either at their place or at our place. But I think our players were a match for Alfreton of National North over 180 minutes. Um, <coughs> Nelts County and Atkinson, again, with respect to both clubs, are now in the bottom four. You could see that when we played them. Neither of them really got much of a fight. You could see that they were clubs getting ready to go on long, long losing runs themselves. Um, there wasn't a lot of capability. The one result that we got, that you'd have to look back on and say, yeah, decent performance, decent result was Carlisle, and you always produce something out of nothing somewhere on the line. So, yeah, I think, you, I think getting, a, getting a result somewhere along the line um, can always happen on a, on a particular day. They don't play particularly well. You get away with a few bits and pieces. Um, you know, you get a couple of goals. Were we rampage and marauding, though we were on the back foot in our own penalty area, getting away with things, we've got a break where goals to go to. You know, in some respect, we did a similar thing against Portsmouth. They just got the goals back um, where Carlisle didn't. So, as far as I'm concerned, the seven unbeaten, um, yeah, Alfredson twice, not County Yankees, and we've been Wimbledon reserves out there. You want momentum, you want to talk those things up because you want to build player confidence, but nothing was really fooling me even then. The people around me will tell you that. I wasn't getting carried away with the fact we went that seven I beat. What we were playing against was similar to us, the bottom end of the league two, um, the National North. So that's, that's for me, you know, what happened. When we suddenly started playing the Portsmouths and the Plymouths, we got found out. We were shown up for what we were, which is a sign that, you know, struggles to cut it at football league level, and we probably struggle to cut it in National North. If you said to me, inherit this group and go and win the National North, I wouldn't fancy any chance of doing it. Honestly, wouldn't have had a chance to do it. Today, we'd smash National North. Today, we'd be champions in National North because the boys who were in front of me on the training ground were good enough to go and smash National North. But back then, we weren't. We drew one or lower up the Okay, um, the mics have just gone down a little bit, so we'll do it the old fashioned way. Any <coughs> other questions? David, when he, he spoke about walking into this club, and he mentioned three people. And I'm in the same view as what Graham's on about. There's three people who are actually running this club, i.e., the names have been mentioned. They're doing, I personally myself think, we need more people helping out because people are not doing their jobs when they're doing other people's jobs. And it's no good stat, stat, sitting down and saying, yeah, we'll look into it. One of the reasons why we're financially not making as much money because things which we got planned in, in the thing have all failed. I got to bring two of them up, the Christmas party. Why was that cancelled? At Christmas, you're supposed to make money. One of the reasons with there's poor sales, I think the organising of it is not down to Watsy or whatever, <coughs> completely down to them, but he didn't have enough help, but there wasn't enough time. 
It was all left to certain people, like the finance man. He does the finances, but he isn't. He's doing programs, he's doing 50-50, he's doing something else. Again, that man's not doing his job properly. And then we go to the other one, but why was the Christmas party cancelled? Why, as the other venues which we've been doing, they've not been supported <coughs> properly. I am not having to go with Mr. Watts or the other people because they're doing their, doing their best. But when you've got people who don't even live in Newport, I'm not having to go with any of you members down there, but we are one club, not one man, three men, we are a club. And there's too many people doing too many jobs, getting criticised for it, and they need help. Finance. We're losing money. We're not raising any money, we're losing it. We shouldn't be. That sheet should be a lot better off when it was finances. We're paying out money to people who don't even work here anymore. The old setup, it's got to be looked at, but the main thing is we work in one club, not individuals. That's right. Uh, I have every sympathy with what you say. Um, and indeed, the manager has touched on it. We have been in a process of evolution since the trust took over, if you like, the ownership of the club. To be honest, and I'm a relatively new member of the board, what I found, even when we took over, was a pretty disorganized shambles. That's nothing to do with the employees, it's what the arrangements were. We have been working hard in the last few months. And the first thing we've done is to get a good administrative team. And now we have an absolutely outstanding group of four people. What we now need to do is build on that with volunteer support. And I think you, you, you're right in that, we need to do it. I can assure you that no one individual, myself, Gavin, Sean, whoever, is looking for glory in this. Uh, there ain't no glory, it's just hurt. We're just having to do it one thing at a time. And the problem we're continually faced with is new problems arising which are distracting us from our core aims. I mean, Rodney Parade is a primary. Uh, we now have to organize, for example, there has to be match uh, cover of the ground if the weather forecast is for rain. And that's had to be organized and set up and so on and so forth. It takes a long time. It's, it's part of the problem, and it, it, it's something that you'll hear again and again. We are undercapitalized. We simply don't have enough working capital to do the various things. If I were to tell you, in this year, we're looking probably with the various things and net of the cupping of what we've had, and net of some savings we've made in administration, we're still looking at a loss of in excess of 200,000. And you've seen that we've only got just over 300,000 in hand. And what we are doing about it is, in the next few days, my colleague Sean will be relaunching the rewards and benefits scheme, and that will hopefully bring in more money and assist in our general problem. We've also brought Mark onto the board, and there will be a further new scheme coming to raise capital, particularly not directed at the business community, but with us all able to join in it as well, a form of community shares, but one that gives positive payback if certain events happen. If, for example, we have a good cup run, part of that cup run would accrue to the people who bought community shares. We're working at all that. One of the issues we have, and I know Gavin will bear me out on this, is when we call for volunteers, there's a bloody great silence. You know, certain people come forward and they work bloody hard, and we're very grateful. Uh, Duncan Jardine and the program team is a, is a very good example. All volunteers, they work hard, but we don't get that many. And it's not volunteering in the management of business like this. It's not a thing where you can pick it out <coughs> when you feel like it. It's like, it's like being married to my wife. I have to deal with her every day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, the Christmas party, I'm not taking any bloody part in that. Uh, Gavin made the decision, he can tell you what he can The reason, Phil, I think you know this, uh, one of the reasons why the Christmas party was uh, cancelled in the way it was, is it was on the day that the game was abandoned, and one of the things that uh, we discussed was the fact that uh, the players would have had to wait around nearly three and a half to four hours to come to there for a couple of hours and drive to the different places that they lived. Um, and 
we felt that was a difficult thing with the matches that we had coming. So therefore we made a decision, we looked at the finances as to whether it was going to cost the club and whether we could refer the people that we wanted to refund, we bought tickets, etc. And that's why we made that decision. Now, you know, it might be right, wrong, don't know. Uh, but we made that decision based on, on those factors. In terms of what you've raised and the state of the pitch, is there any chance of a rebate on the rent? Or any assistance with some of the costs with the, um, the recoveries, etc.? Well, I, I met with um, Stuart Davies today, actually, and we discussed this. And we've gone through a kind of iterative process. We've obviously had a report done. You may want to read the report. It's leaked out into the, the press. And there's certain recommendations that they've got in there. We've given a commitment to the league that we will do that. And we've got to work with Rodney Parade uh, to, make, to make those things good. There's work that they are doing throughout the summer where they will be funding that. We won't be funding that. Um, what we have to look at, and we've yet to bop this out, is that we've given a commitment to the league that we will put some covers on it, and we've got to have those discussions with them. Our view, very much, is that we pay for a playing service, therefore there should be some kind of contribution. Is Well, that kind of factored in some of the discussions I had with Stuart today, and I think we as a board have looked at this as well. Um, Sean and Malcolm have met with uh, the CEO of the uh, City Council. I, I think, and I know this is shared by a lot of the board as well, is that Newport as a city has got to decide whether it wants a football club, it wants a rugby club, in what is a prime location at the end of the day. So, and if they want that, I think that they're going to have to uh, dig deep help us out with the situation that we're in. David brought uh, Jay Bryant to the match on Saturday and she said that you know she would try and help as much as we can. And I think what we've got to do is start to rally those stakeholders now to help us to unlock some of this funding, whether it be sport, Wales, whether it be the council, whatever it may well be. But if they want football and rugby in this city centre, they've got to help us out. Well. So we'll <coughs> And as I say, um, Malcolm and, and Sean have, have had discussions with uh, the CEO of the council around that as well. I think, to be fair to them, they recognise that the development over there is now done. They've got to look aside, um, and, and we're certainly trying to uh, make that point. So, you know, for me, I think that, that is something that, again, if they want, that's in the city centre. Where else in the country do you see a venue like this in the city centre? There's not very many. But what Swansea uh, City Council have done, we've got to start to actually try and lobby the city council to do the same. Yeah. You know, um, you know, council still own Spitty Park. I know you've got money involved in it. Because some people say, oh, if we go back there, they can spend a hundred thousand pounds on the ground. But it's not our, it's, not, it's, it's a council ground, isn't it? Well, it's, it's owned by Newport Live. It's owned by Newport Live. I mean, oh, in effect, though, Newport oh. Live report up into yeah. Newport City Council. So, yes, in essence, it ultimately may take the risk there to share on the floor, yeah. Does anybody really know what's wrong with the drainage over there? Well, um, we've had an expert report uh, commissioned by the league, um, and they've identified what the issues were. I think it's no great secret that there are problems with the. Uh, Drainage, not just what we see on, on the pitch, but what the report said um, it, itself. So, you know, there are issues. I think what the, the challenge we've got now is the fact that we're in season, the match is on, so there is limited work in which they can do. The Football League, Malcolm and I have met with them on a number of occasions around the, the pitch. Um, they're willing to help us, but they're also saying to us that you've got to recognise your responsibilities, and that is to have a pitch that's football, for, fit for the Football League. Um, that blatantly is, is not as good as it should be at, at the moment. But in terms
terms of work to be done, that's going to be in the post season from what the report said, in terms of what the experts are saying. I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything to that at all. Well, I, I can only echo what was said. The chief executive of the city council, when we spoke to him, he was very sympathetic to the concept of, uh, of developing this side of the river. He also took the opportunity, as people in local government always do, to point out to me that the, the council had received God knows how much cuts and he didn't have any money. But he did undertake that later in this year, he would raise the matter with, with local property members. Mm. So that, that I saw, we, I think Sean and I saw as an important move forward. The other thing is to say is that when Sean and I, uh, Gav, Gav and I spoke with the Football League, they were quite dynamic in their understanding of our problem and our situation. And they said that they are prepared to live with the issue of this current season, subject to the covering but they expect to see positive action in the close season. And that's the message we're conveying to Rodney Parade. It's one of the most used pictures in Britain. It's not three clubs. It's one of the most used pictures in Britain. It's not the most used pitch. First line of the EFL report. The pitch is overused. But surely they passed it in the first place. When we came here, surely the double league passed it as a ground for yep. playoff. Yes, they did. And Think, but events, I mean, you need to read the whole report. Events that have happened didn't help that. <coughs> I think the danger Are you going to show is... show us the report? <laughs> well, I thought <should. laughs> No, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say, I, I, I think what we all, we all need to do is, you know, the pitch has been an almighty cocker. Yeah. But we need to stop looking backwards, I suggest, and we need to look forward. What the hell are we going to do about it? Yeah. Uh, and that's the conversation that Gavara and I are having. And I'll frankly say to you, sooner or later, we're going to have to produce some money for it somewhere. And when I say we, I mean everybody in this room. Because it ain't going to sort itself out overnight, and it ain't going to sort itself out without a considerable sum of money being spent. And we all know how well, well, uh, Situated the rugby club is financially. So, uh, assuming that money. Can anyone raised, assume? Yeah, please, you can your idea. Uh, I you. beg your pardon. <coughs> assuming that money could be raised, how could we, we be sure this time, whatever drainage goes in, will be fit for the job and will actually do the job? Well, what we have done is to retain the consultants who did the report for the EFL, and we would use them as our advisors this time. Can I ask? <coughs> By extension to everything you mentioned about the pitch and the, the season after the and the football league requirements, are there any circumstances under which the football league could insistently move out of the first? I, I believe there are, Gary. <coughs> well, I think they may be playing to us. Yes, I mean, they simply say your pitch, your ground is not this sufficient. We will not allow you to continue there. But the problem we have is where do we go? Because Spiffy ain't up to stand it. Uh, it's not within our control, it's within the council's gift as to where we do that, and there ain't anywhere else. Uh, it's, 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 it's a hopeless dilemma, and it all came about, in my view, from, and the manager's just been looking through the agreement, which we've got up here, that the process of the agreement wasn't thought through properly at the time of the move across. And we're, we're picking up the penalty. But again, I don't want to look backwards. Yes, there's no point. We've got a bloody sword here. Yeah, okay. Well, when we've been talking tonight, we've always talked about the lack of resources, lack of funding. They're obviously boils down the cash, don't they? Yep. So what are we going to do about the fans for the model? The youth? And what are we doing? How are we going to get tomorrow's fans through the door? What are we going to do about it? Neil, do you want to come yeah, in? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we met Dave a little while ago, and as we know, it's fighting fires all the way since at least since the summer when I've been involved. I mean, it's the manager, the secretary, the pitch, whatever. Um, we've just launched uh, the junior fan club now, which is free. Uh, but it's been a soft launch, so there hasn't been any PR done on it yet, so we want to make sure the website, the Facebook, everything works first. We've got about 80 members on it now, which is free for everyone under 16. They get four match tickets, vouchers for matches, with an adult paying £10. So that is exactly the point. Fans are tomorrow, so if they're whatever age, 
there's going to be a letter of membership going to them with a membership card and the vouchers. Under 11 is coming from Spitty, 12 and up is coming from Graham. Not that he knows it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're going to get call an that invite. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're going to get an invite to come to the game with four vouchers, sort of thing. That's going through the whole of Gwent leagues. So Newport and District's got 1,800 registered kids. Then there's North Gwent, East Gwent, is going. Um, so all of those leagues, there's four and a half thousand kids. So they're the fans of tomorrow. So we have missed a generation when we're in the lower reaches. So there, there, is, there is work being done, but it all just takes time, Dave. I think the other thing, Dave, is following on with the season ticket and the targeting for that youth group last year, which we committed to doing next season as well. So that's been successful. It, it led to a rise in the amount of take up of the under 16s in terms of season tickets, and we'll be looking to push that again next year. I think we ought to give some recognition as well to Norman Parcell and the community team yeah. because they do a fantastic yeah. job. Yeah. You know, on a Saturday they do the match day experience, you've got hundreds of people there. Yeah. I think the game, you know, where they reach out to, they're the next generation of supporters as well and, and the players go down, they meet them down there, they sign after them and, you know, the feedback they get is really, really positive and I think it's one of the things in the club that we don't celebrate enough because I think what he does on that side of life with the resources he got is pretty good. So you got a question. Yeah. Um, when the shareholders took over, uh, the fans took over the club, um, the board said that they were going to be in communication with the fans all the way through on all the decisions and that's filtered out uh, over the last year. There's very little communication from the board at all to us fans. Um, like tonight, I didn't receive anything other than social media about the meeting tonight. Some people had letters, some people didn't. And I think a lot more needs to be done by the board to stay in communication with us fans. I think, cool. yeah, I think I agree with you. I think over the last uh, sort of four or five months, it's slipped um, and it's not good enough, really. So I think um, there's a clear commitment to reintroduce the monthly updates and keep on that and make sure that's kept up to date. So I think there is a is a recognition that we haven't communicated as George, well as we should have. Oh, we haven't communicated as well as we should over the last four or five months, and uh, that's been addressed as well then. Uh, and made up. We got our program in terms of fundraising and putting a, a schedule of events this year so there's to avoid clash. So we had a, a sort of working group meeting on that uh, towards the end of November. And one of the things that we'll be putting in place is quarterly fans forums as well. Um, so there's more where we have the start of the season, we have the one in the river front, Riverside rather, and that will be introduced on a programme quarterly basis, so that will be released within the next couple of weeks as well. Um, I'm going to suggest it's very difficult to hear over here because we have got the, 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 the mics working, so one last question and Rob's going to... It's a question for all of the uh, board individually to answer. Do they think the first one works? And do they see us being a trust only club in two years time? Um, I'll answer it first. Um, I think there's a, a lot of challenges with the trust model. I think there needs to be a lot more take up and what we're trying to do on rewards and benefits, and Malcolm touched upon it earlier, is trying to make us a real, real owners of the club, where we'll look at windfalls and having a percentage return for anyone that invests going forward as well and to try and get that level of secure income coming into the club because I think at the moment, as Malcolm touched upon, we're not getting enough income in, we're not doing enough ourselves probably from a communication point of view and more needs to be done to make this workable. Um, I'm not dogmatic about the trust, um, whatever works possibly the best way going forward in terms of income streams and a diversity of income streams, I'm pretty open, there's no willingness for any of us to cling on to power for power's sake. And I think there's a recognition that we need to get more investment into the football club. Um, how that investment works, I think going back to a less scanning scenario where one person could pull their money out and it all falls apart would not be a route that we'd want to go down in the future. But the diversity of input and incomes, I think, yeah, I think we've got to look at it in the future. But sure, would it be, would it be better to say <coughs> Strength, set these people, 
look, well, give us your experts. Because if we actually don't need business people's money, we need their expertise to make decisions and to maybe work with others. So we can get the pitch sort of so <laughs> Yeah, so, so if I if, if I can just sort of cut across it from a manager's point of view, I when I was sitting here listening earlier on, what really struck me was that we got the twenty second biggest income in the football league. So, yeah, twenty twenty second biggest as in like third lowest. Um, we are we are a very small football club. There's clubs there like Portsmouth. We've got massive incomes relative to us. And when you say, does the trust scenario work? I'd say, look at it differently. If you're very, very small, what you've got to be is very, very good at the things that have the max, the, the biggest em uh, effect on results. Does that make sense? Yeah. You can't do everything that Portsmouth can do. You've got to be very focused and very good at the things you do. I think that at Newport, we try to do everything everyone else does, but we don't do it very well. And what we need to do is narrow down what we do so that what we do, we do very, very well. Do better than other people. Because if we concentrate on the things that generate results, the things that generate maximum, in the biggest income streams, then we give ourselves a chance. If we don't focus, then we'll never succeed. Because being small, you've got to be very, very good. You can't be small and very average at everything. You've got to be very, very good at certain things to succeed. And I, I helped build, I, was a, I played a central role in building a very, very small club at Stevenage into a very successful club. And the reason why we succeeded is because what we did, we did better than anyone else, even the ones with six million incomes. But we focused on the things we could be the best at. We didn't bother with the things that other people were going to be best at. Does that make sense? So for me, a trust model can work, but you've got to have a trust model that's focused on things and doesn't like do a lot of things badly does certain things very, very well. So, last question. More of a statement. Um, making the most of what we've got, and Graham said that they were made the best, to get the best in the country. We've actually got a trust online shop. It's actually over 10,000 retailers. Number one in the country. Newport County is number one. Um, it's in the marketing plan. There's one thing I'd ask you to do, because I was involved in setting it up, made it number one in the country. When you leave tonight, no matter what your opinions are, of whether you're for or against the trust or not, is to check them on the club website, or the trust website, and register, and raise money for nothing for this club. Because we are number one in that particular field. <laughs> Can you explain what it is? It's it's part, for those who aren't aware, can you explain what it is, please? Neil, it's part of what you're thinking of. Yeah, no, I, I know. Yeah. Can you explain for those who ask what it is? It's called affiliate marketing. And it's the one thing that we're number one in. I was, I was a driving force in putting it there. Basically, you put an app. Basically, what it is, to anybody, anybody who shops, anybody who shops online, go through the trust shop first, so for, if for example you want to book a holiday which is paying 40 pound commission at the moment, and you book it through Thomas Cook, if you go through this link that is there on the trust site, you will get exactly the same holiday, but for example the club will get 40. If you look at the bottom right of that um, website, it will give you the top five fundraisers. And in those top, those top five fundraisers, have raised two and a half thousand pounds. Graham goes on about making the most of the best of what we're good at. And we're good at that. We've got, I never, when I did it before, I had to do it through message boards. We've got a collective group here of four or five hundred people. You need to do it, you need to start using it, because it works. And it costs you absolutely nothing. Thank you for following the guidelines I suggested. I think that's been a really constructive meeting and we've made some important decisions. I hope you feel briefed on where Graham is taking the team. Let's get three points on Saturday. See you next year. Can I make three quick points, please, before we go? Gentlemen. David's just going to say a few words, please. Firstly, you
you may be aware that the chairman of the Wrexham Club Trust resigned, saying that the trust model was not suitable for a football club. We were contacted by BBC Wales to comment on this. I took the call but passed it on to Gavin. They couldn't get Gavin, so they came back to me. And I said that when the club was founded in 1989, it was founded, financed, and run by Aubrey supporters. I said, we've got back to that modeling to some extent. And I said, even when the businessmen came in, they realized the value of volunteers. And that's the, one of the strengths of this, of the number of volunteers. And all these people are volunteers here. And they're not paid. And yet they put their, their efforts forward. That's the first point. So the second point, Will I please ask representatives of the supporters partnership to meet with me over here for one minute afterwards. And finally, I'd like to propose a vote of thanks to all these people. Where are all